Thanks, Martin. I really appreciate that. Uh, it's really amazing and an honor to be speaking here today. This is a, a really an unbelievable event. So uh, I'm excited. Uh, so I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Williams. And uh, look, it sounds goofy, but I love software. Read uh, David Gerlenter's Truth, Beauty, and the Virtual Machine for why. So I started programming in 1983. I started breaking copy protection for fun in 1984 and reverse engineered a, a binary operating system in 1985. I've been running code ever since, um, including yesterday. I spent my entire career trying to make sure that the software we create doesn't end up killing us. And I don't mean Terminator style. What I mean is as software gets increasingly complex, connected and critical, those are the three C's of the apocalypse. When those things increase, vulnerability goes through the roof. And it's almost impossible to see that this won't end badly unless we start doing something different. I don't know why as a species, we seem unable to do anything about things that are certain to be problems in the future. They're not critical immediately. I mean, look, breaches are bad now, but they will get really bad and people will die. And we can see it coming, but we're not doing anything about it. It's frankly, it's embarrassing. I hope the dolphins aren't like, hey, come on humans, can't you see your software is gonna kill them uh, and probably kill us too? Do something. <laughs> So when I think about the AppSec problem, uh, it's been getting more and more difficult for the past 20 years. Uh, fortunately, at the same time, OWASP has been steadily growing and maturing. And I, I use that term maturing loosely. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have time for the full story today of, uh, of how OWASP almost disappeared forever. We almost died when early on our two beautiful Spark Station servers were suddenly confiscated by the data center that we had been squatting in. Uh, we were in someone else's uh, cage. And OWASP went offline. I tracked it down. I, I argued with their lawyers, but we couldn't get our servers back. It took us, uh, OWASP went completely offline for several weeks while we found someone to donate new servers. And then we had, there weren't backups. We had to create OWASP from the ground up. We totally started over. Uh, I also can't tell you uh, the full story of how I almost got arrested by the minister of IT in Portugal after we held a very helpful hackathon, which the press reported as hackers target Portuguese companies. And I'd love to tell you the full story of uh, how a former OS board member once attempted to drive a stolen golf cart into a swimming pool, dumping another OSPer into the pool and kicking off an all night game of cat and mouse with the cops. Um, and I really can't tell you how unbelievably proud I am that OS has championed diversity, equity, and inclusion in security with programs like Women in AppSec, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and, and so on. Um, so look, despite some shenanigans, OWASP plays a really important role in the software ecosystem. I truly believe after 20 years of hard work by brilliant people at OWASP, we've already benefited almost everyone's life. OWASP, we've influenced standards, we've improved programming languages and frameworks. Uh, we've informed millions of developers worldwide about security. We've improved tools, built some ourselves and improved others. And we fostered security culture. And for the most part, we've had a lot of fun doing it. Um, but we're not there yet. In those 20 years, software has rocketed ahead at ludicrous speed. Most software innovations are, are today, they're launched well in advance of anyone thinking hard about security, like you know, look at serverless or any, any of the new developments in software. Most apps and APIs today are still extremely vulnerable. Attackers are continuing to innovate. Look, you could argue that even if, if OWASP was just keeping pace or keeping close with software, that would be a huge victory. And maybe, but look, I'm not celebrating yet. It's mission not accomplished. 
we got to be patient. Uh, it took decades for automobiles to become safer. And it wasn't really one thing that did it. It was a combination of outspoken leaders, exploding gas tanks, regulation, court cases, crash testing, innovative companies that decided that, that safety was a differentiator. If you look at the history of auto safety, from the time that Ralph Nader published Unsafe at Any Speed about how unsafe a car called the Corvair was, it took 20 years after that for the first seatbelt law to be put in place in New York City. It took 30 years for mandatory crash testing to start. And it took 40 years for the first mandatory vehicle safety label to be created. That's crazy. That's, that's a long time, but here we are at 20 years and we're still in the, you know, kind of the getting started stage of application security. So that's kind of the big picture. That's the journey that we're all on together. And speaking of the automobile market, we realized pretty early on that the software market is broken. If you haven't learned about the market for lemons, you should read up. Uh, the theory is pretty simple. Uh, in the used car market, you won't know if you're buying a lemon, and that's a car with unknown flaws, uh, because you don't have the right information, right? You, you, uh, you, buy, you just buy the car and you don't understand what if there's any problems in it. That's called a lemon. So you're not going to pay full price if there's a chance that that car might be a lemon. You'll discount that price, right? And that means, and this is, this is the key here, that means that sellers with good cars can't get full value for their vehicle in the used car market, so they won't sell. And ultimately, that means that the whole used car market is full of lemons. So a guy named George Akerlof won the Nobel Prize for identifying that asymmetric information between buyers and sellers causes this market failure. Now, if you're following along, hopefully that sounds like the software market to you. Can consumers really tell the difference between a basically secure online app and one with massive holes? No, it's actually really difficult. Many of us you know, make our living testing applications to see if they contain some kind of vulnerabilities hidden deep inside there. So there's really no incentive for producers today, you know, in the big picture, there's not much incentive for producers to do better security because consumers can't tell the difference and they're not gonna pay more for secure products. So, you know, where's the incentive? And naturally the, the, it follows that the software market is full of lemons. And that's what we see in, in the marketplace is software that's pretty riddled with security. There's actually a good paper out there that considers whether security is a market for limes where buyers have more information like the insurance market or whether it's a market for silver bullets where both parties are in the dark uh, about security. And there's a good argument that security is there. But in any case, it's a problem with information. And there's numerous ways for uh, to intervene in markets to fix market problems like this asymmetric information problem. For instance, you could create tax incentives for people who create secure software, or you could create much more rigorous government regulations uh, with penalties. You could fine companies if they create vulnerabilities. You could even sue software vendors or even developers for negligence. Uh, you put, put developers in jail as, as a criminal kind of offense. But I'm not a favor of any of those. I think the least intrusive way to intervene in the software market is and fix this information asymmetry problem is to require visibility. Visibility levels the playing field. When consumers have all the details about security, they can make an informed choice. They can choose the software that matches their risk tolerance. So producers also become incentivized to improve their products, to win customers and avoid embarrassment in the market. So now market forces can work to help us find the ideal level of security, which is not perfect security, by the way. We wanna match what consumers want and what producers can produce. Uh, this same approach works at multiple different scales. You can think about the whole market or you can think of the microcosm of your own company 
producing software. When you make security visible, good decisions will follow. And I, I say all that because I want to get back to OWASP. So a uh, quick quiz here. Does anybody know what the mission of OWASP is today? If you're on the Slack, uh, go ahead and type it in the chat. If you don't know what the, the OWASP mission is, I'd love it if you would share what you think it should be. Uh, I'd like to try to pull all the all some answers together and, and see what we can get. Um, the answer actually today is that it seems to have been deleted. Uh, it's not on the website, at least anywhere I could find. So OWASP, it seems to me, is a bit of a rudderless ship at the moment. And really, organizations should have a mission. A mission, to me, is a statement of how you're going to help achieve a vision. And when I say vision, I mean a picture of the world the way you want it to be. And actually, I think we're clear on the vision. Uh, we're here because we want security to be worthy of the trust that we're all already putting into it. Today, software controls your finances, your health care, your elections, your power grid, your car, airplanes, factories, government uh, weapons, your social life, and a whole bunch more. I guarantee you have literally trusted your life to software today, probably many times. But I seriously doubt that any of that software has earned your trust. But I can imagine a future world where I have good reason to trust the software that I rely on. That's the vision. That's the world I want to be part of. But we got to step up our game. If, you know, today you have absolutely no reason to trust software, but you do. And even if you're inside a company, your assurance case is really weak. Uh, if you pick a random application in your company and ask, you know, is this thing really secure? You'll probably see a random set of tests with unknown coverage and unknown accuracy, sometimes performed by some tool. Uh, you might get a secure coding standard with thousands of requirements that nobody ever reads or tests. You'll get a threat model built on some, if you're lucky, you'll get a threat model. And it probably is built on top of diagrams, uh, Visio diagrams from three years ago. You might get a pen test by a random consultant with two years of experience. I'm just not 100% convinced, are you? Does anything we do really matter if we don't end up with some evidence that we're defending things right? I'll just throw that out there. I want you to think about that. So look, that's, uh, so let's, let's talk about the mission to get there, right? So here's the original mission that we set many years ago at OWASP. It says, our mission is to make application security visible so that people and organizations can make informed decisions about true security risks. I call this security in sunshine. It's a mission to fix the information asymmetry in the software market so that the market itself, market forces will encourage security. And we've gotta be realistic here. There is nothing we can do to make a meaningful dent in software security if we're swimming upstream against market forces. I'm sorry, it just will never work. We'll be here in another 20 years saying the same stuff. As Ice-T said, don't hate the playa, hate the game. And I'm sorry to say that despite fantastic people doing great work, applications really aren't substantially more secure than they were 20 years ago. Uh, we just can't fight against the invisible hand in the market. So look, dozens of markets have been transformed by encouraging visibility. Food, tobacco, drugs, sweeteners, music, movies, cars, vehicles, energy efficiency, vending machines, cleaning products, alcohol, genetically modified foods, recyclables, and a bunch more. This is an idea that works. There are a lot of things that we can do to, to, to encourage visibility. Personally, I've been talking about 
the power of software security labels in the market since almost the beginning of OWASP, you have to realize that even if zero consumers read a label like this, none of them read it, it'll still have a big effect. Simply requiring more transparency into what software producers have done to secure their software will cause them to improve the security of their products. Their lawyers won't let them put a label on that says, this product is riddled with vulnerabilities <laughs> and it wasn't tested for security. This effect has happened over and over in many different markets when labels are introduced. Producers get affected first, even if no consumers are reading the label. Over the years, I've studied this issue very carefully. Uh, there are an overwhelming number of rigorous scientific studies that focus on the effects of labeling approaches in, in all the different markets I've mentioned. And I've talked with many agencies. I've met with congressmen and senators about this idea. I've uh, talked to pretty much anybody who would listen. And OWASP has had several projects to investigate this idea, to explore and prototype software security labels. And people have apparently been listening. I am so excited that this idea is a key initiative in the recent cybersecurity executive order. The president directed NIST to initiate software security labeling programs for both consumer software and IoT devices. That's major progress. Uh, last week, I was invited to speak at a two-day event from NIST focused entirely on this initiative and thousands of people attended to learn about what's gonna happen here. There are a lot of disagreements about what a label like this will look like. How detailed should it be? Should consumers create their own label? I mean, so should producers create their own labels? Uh, I'm right in there fighting and arguing about how it should look, but the truth is, shh, it really doesn't matter very much. Most labels, like Energy Star, for example, they start out with a ton of details and over time, they get revised simpler and simpler as people realize that it's not the details that are driving the benefit for either consumers or producers. So what we put in the label is less important than that we get labels out there and people start using them. Okay, so I wanna spend a minute on DevSecOps. Uh, first, I wanna say shifting left is a really terrible way of thinking about what we're doing here. First of all, we need to have security in all parts of the development life cycle, including operations all the way to the right, uh, not just shifting left, but more importantly, shifting sounds like we're doing the same thing and moving it to another place. But that's not gonna work. Just like DevOps restructured the work of development into small pieces and so on, we need to restructure the work of security. You get it? DevSecOps is about changing how we do security. It's not about modifying DevOps or Dev or Ops. This is about us and how we work. <laughs> Dev and Ops are fine. <laughs> we have a chance to really rethink how security gets created, how it gets measured, how it gets communicated, how we deliver value. Today, security is still almost always done in a waterfall way. We're spending tons of time on big monolithic deliverables like security requirements documents and security architecture and a entire security pen test. We're not breaking down the work into small pieces like, hey, I'm going to work on click checking today and I'm gonna put a defense in place and I'm gonna put automated tests in place and I'm going to get evidence that I did it right and I'm gonna make that part of my pipeline. That's like one little unit of work that we can accomplish that has traceability. We'll talk a little more about that. But uh, we're not breaking down the work enough. We don't have tight feedback loops on single pieces of work. And we're clearly not pushing value into production all the time. 
So look, we're not really delivering value. I think we have to change this. We've got to figure out better ways to deliver measurable value that's communicatable with other people. That's the key to being visible and valued. And ultimately, that's the whole problem that uh, we're focused on, making security visible. So uh, let's get back to OWASP. Why should you join OWASP? You're all here today. And so guess what? That makes you part of OWASP. Everyone is welcome. Uh, it's a very big tent. And you know, while I'm talking, I would love it if you'd share what you get out of OWASP in the chat. Uh, afterwards, I'll try and put it all together to inspire other folks. But personally, I joined OWASP when it was just a small mailing list with a few dozen people on it. Everyone was experimenting with new ideas. This is, you know, 2001, uh, building tools, writing papers, trying new things. It was, I had such a good time creating OWASP Top 10 and uh, contributing WebGoat and, and dozens of other projects along the way. And I always got a lot more out of those projects than I ever expected. It's really an amazing feeling to contribute something that gets used by I don't know how many millions of people over two decades. It's like that rare win-win-win where contributing is good for you, it's good for your company, it's good for the world. Uh, so I, I really value all those contributions. And actually, don't tell anyone, but I am not a big fan of top 10 lists. Uh, God, I hope that's not what ends up on my tombstone someday. Anyway, uh, maybe you're here because you're seeking fame and fortune as a hacker, or maybe you're trying to learn things that will help you in your career, or maybe, just maybe you're one of those people that just likes being on the steep part of the hill. And application security is at least a V13. <laughs> So there's lots of opportunity. But whatever, whatever your reasons, I wanted to share a few reasons why OWASP is special. OWASP can try crazy things. It's so liberating to be able to build things without commercial pressure, without timelines or roadmaps, just for the love of the game. And there's really no limit to the size of your team. One of the most impressive projects I've ever seen was uh, at OWASP when we created the first OWASP testing guide. Matteo Mucci led the project. He recruited a ton of volunteers to each write an article about a single testing technique. And in one month, we created a 300 page document that was really fantastic. Uh, people were clamoring to participate. So unlike normal organizations, the OWASP workforce is potentially unlimited. And OWASP can actually innovate. Remember, the traditional model, the traditional approach for AppSec, as it's codified in tools and standards and so-called maturity models, has, be has been delivering code that's riddled with vulnerabilities for decades. It's actually, it's deeply ironic to me that th this kind of waterfall thinking and traditional AppSec approach is probably the biggest risk to AppSec. OWASP can make bold moves crazy experiments, but like any community, we've got to be vigilant to protect the cowards and the haters from slowing down innovation. That's something OWASP can provide, a safe place to experiment. And OWASP can focus on public health. Uh, public health. Uh, oh, sorry, I got behind one slide here. So OWASP can focus on public health. There are doctors who treat patients and then there's the World Health Organization to promote health, keep the world safe, serve the vulnerable. Uh, the world needs a WHO for security. And who else is gonna try to improve software security for everybody? Governments? Uh, as Josh Corman might say, we are the cavalry. OWASP can empower communities too. I know for a fact that giving away intellectual property is a way better way to spend your marketing budget than ridiculous conference booths. So why not share that standard, that tool, that invention, whatever, become part of a community? And OWASP is a great platform. It works best when it serves as a platform supporting AppSec projects and innovation. Uh, OWASP should do everything it can to incentivize, recruit, promote, and support projects, but I don't think that OWASP should pick and choose. Let a thousand projects bloom. You can do it. We're at the 
we're in our infancy in application security. Here's some areas that are screaming for innovation. Threat modeling, we're in the stone age. Security architecture, really uh, not practiced well. Malicious code, beyond the state of the art for the most part. Serverless functions, you know, here we go again, new technology and advance of security. Assurance, uh, it'd be nice to produce some. Uh, working on a culture of security, we need a lot more guidance. And I think diversity, equity, and inclusion is also a great place to uh, innovate. So how can we explore all these ideas in parallel? In 1992, uh, Dave Clark captured the governing philosophy of IETF like this. We reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. This is the path forward for OWASP. Should stop trying to control things. We shouldn't try to be a for-profit company or even a traditional nonprofit. As Tyler Durden said, you decide your own level of involvement. The swarm approach, we can solve problems that individuals and even well-funded companies can't. And for God's sakes, let's not end up a training and, and conferences company. That has almost zero impact. So look, let me sum up. OWASP serves a critical role in the transformation of the software market. And although we're not where we need to be, we are making progress. We have an amazing opportunity to make the dolphins proud and get in front of a serious problem for once. Uh, we can break free of the intense gravity of the risk management world and start a new orbit around planet assurance. You'll know we're getting there when you have good reason to trust the software that you depend on. What does that take? We have to figure it out for the dolphins. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, please follow up in the Slack channel. It's OWASP standard classification and uh, connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, enjoy this fantastic event. Thanks.